Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Ledette. I'm an Associate Professor of Disease Ecology and Epidemiology. If we can learn more about the tick, that will help everyone prevent themselves from suffering from a tick-borne disease. So I get the question, where do ticks live? Um, because if you know where ticks live, you can then think about how to protect yourself when you're in their house. So in the past couple decades, we've seen large increases in the recognition of tick and tick-borne diseases. It's evident by the health st statistics out there. But what's actually happening? Well, here in upstate New York and across places in the country, we are seeing the expansion of different species of ticks carrying different types of diseases. And if we look at the most common disease like Lyme disease and the black-legged tick, we know that that tick has really expanded its range as well as its population numbers in the past 20 or 30 years, depending on where you are in this country. And that's due to a, a bunch of different factors, but one of them is the habitat and the conditions they need for their survival and their increase in population numbers. So ticks need blood meals. That means they need animal sources for blood meals. And two really good sources for tick blood meals are small rodents, like mice, and large mammals like deer. So if you have those two, you have a really good setting for the perpetuation of tick populations, the black-legged tick, as well as Lyme disease, thinking about those small rodents being the reservoir where the Lyme disease bacteria hide out in nature. Couple that with the way humans have interacted with our environment. We can see over the last century, the last two centuries, humans have uh, deforested North America for things like fuel, housing, lodging, agricultural land. And that initially decreased habitat for both the tick as well as the animals they feed on. Now, a lot of us have realized that's not a good thing. And we've tried to bring back the environment. We've tried to conserve the environment, but that looks very different than it did 200 years ago. The large swaths of forest we used to have are now fragmented little pieces of forest. And a fragmented small forest looks very different than a virgin, unfragmented, untouched forest landscape, both in how large they are and what type of trees they have, but also what type of animal communities they support. So these fragmented lands that are close to human dwellings really support populations of small rodents, which are great reservoirs for the pathogen that cause Lyme disease, as well as deer. We know, and across this country, deer are interacting with humans. You can go up here in upstate New York and see four or five deer in your yard. And where you have deer and where you have rodents, you're gonna have ticks and the disease they transmit. So that fragmentation of the habitat lead to these small patches of land that support large numbers of rodents, deer, and subsequently ticks and disease. Not only are those habitats or those fragmented areas supporting these large focal areas of disease, but that's also the places we contact most. The edge of your yard, that forest, that tree line, that's the area where we come into contact with wildlife. That mowed grass in your front yard, you know, there's not a lot of rodents running around during the middle of the day, less tick populations, but it is those fragmented forested areas that we're building around and conserving that is increasing humans' interactions with tick and animal habitats.